The topics of third session are key issues in trade, trademark cases dealing with descriptive mark distinctiveness through use trademark survey evidence. I am delighted to present the session's moderator, Honorable High Court Judge Hyungun Lee of Patent Korea. 3 session 주제는 상표권의 주요 쟁점으로서 기술적 표장, 사용에 의한 식별력, 설문조사의 활용에 대해 다룹니다. 진행은 이형근 특허법원 고법판사님께서 맡아주시겠습니다. Please join me in welcoming him. 큰 박수 부탁드립니다. Good afternoon. I am uh, Yi Hyung-gun, judge at the Patent Court. During this session, we will uh, discuss about descriptive mark uh, acquisition and of uh, distinctiveness through use and uh, the use of survey. I will introduce our panels. Please refer to the reference book for their detailed CV. Uh, we first have Attorney David H. Bernstein from the U.S. who is an adjunct professor at New York University and a trademark lawyer. And we have Judge uh, James Miller uh, from the High Court of Wales, England, of the U.K. And we have uh, Judge Kumiko Katsumata from uh, the Intellectual Property High Court of Japan. Next, we have with us online Judge Hui Su from China. Thank you, welcome. And we have Judge Christian Schmaltz with us uh, through uh, the video recorded presentation due to a schedule conflict. Now we have Judge uh, Yonggi Kim from the Patent Court High Court. And we have uh, Judge Kwon Bo Wan from the Hong Song branch of Taejon District Court. Now we will uh, dive into the first topic, which is descriptive marks. Based on uh, the material that you have prepared, we will hear presentations from the panels, and uh, Judge Kim Young Gi will pose questions to individual panels. Uh, please uh, keep to keep your responses to the time five minutes and uh, response to the questions uh, to two minutes. Uh, let's start with Attorney Bernstein. Excellent. So uh, it's good to be back. And as I mentioned uh, earlier uh, this afternoon, we're going to focus on some of the issues that come up with distinctive trademarks and descriptive trademarks. So we'll start by looking at descriptive marks. So in the United States, we would say that a trademark is descriptive if it immediately uh, communicates something about the, the goods or the services. This is from the Trademark Manual of Examining Procedure, uh, which is the document used by the United States Patent and Trademark Office to educate the trademark examiners on what they should be looking for. So in the context of applying for a trademark, the trademark office will look at this unique, uh, that this, this document to see, does the trademark itself immediately tell you something about the goods? And one of the common tests that we use is known as the, examination, uh, the imagination test. The question is, how much do you have to imagine something that goes beyond just the mere words of the mark? If you use, for example, the term apple, Obviously, for the fruit, it would be generic. There's no imagination at all. If you're thinking about it for computers um, or for music, uh, because the Beatles music company was called Apple Music, there, there's no amount of imagination um, that you would need because it just is completely fanciful or, uh, or arbitrary compared to those goods. The really hard distinction is between suggestive marks and descriptive marks. And in the United States, uh, we use a, a spectrum. And I'll be quite curious to hear how similar the laws are in, in other parts of the world. So the very strongest trademarks in the United States system are arbitrary or fanciful marks. So for example, the word Apple has nothing at all to do with computers. And therefore, that would be arbitrary. And the word Kodak is a completely made up word. 
Um, and so these are the strongest trademarks that we have in the United States system. Just below that are marks that we think of as suggestive. Here, it does take some imagination to understand what's at issue. So for example, we have a brand of tuna fish in the United States called chicken of the sea. So there's no chicken that lives in the ocean. So you really have to imagine what might that be for you to understand, oh, maybe it's tuna fish. So that still is, it's suggestive. It doesn't describe tuna fish, but if you think about it, if you apply some imagination, you can understand, oh, I guess this is a white meat that comes from the ocean. Similarly, we have a brand of suntan uh, oil or sunblock called Copper Tone. Um, and you can see the famous image uh, from their advertising of the little girl with the dog pulling down her bathing suit. Uh, this is probably not politically correct anymore today, but this was their classic uh, logo for many years. And the idea was that if you use copper tone, it will give your skin a nice copper tone. Again, it doesn't immediately describe anything about the, the uh, sunblock, you really have to use some imagination to see, oh, what does this have to do with sunblock? When we move to descriptive trademarks, now we get into the area where the trademarks really describe something about the goods or the services. So there's a very famous brand of mayonnaise in the United States called Best Foods. Um, that's just a laudatory trademark. That's something that we would consider descriptive in the United States. Um, vitamin water. It's a water beverage that's flavored and includes vitamins and minerals in it. Um, that's a descriptive trademark because it tells you something immediately about the goods or services. It doesn't take a lot of imagination to wonder what vitamin water might be. Even my law firm name, Debevoys and Plimpton, it was based on the names of the two founders of our law firm, um, Eli Whitney Debevoys and Francis Plimpton. And so uh, uh, people's surnames can never be dis uh, inherently distinctive. They're always descriptive. It's descriptive of a law firm founded by Mr. Debevoise and, and Mr. Plimpton. At the very end, of course, we have generic terms, terms like apple for the fruit or facial tissue um, for uh, a brand that some people think of as Kleenex. The key thing about this is that if a trademark is arbitrary or fanciful or suggestive, under the US system, it's inherently distinctive. It's automatically protectable. You don't need any secondary meaning at all. We'll talk about how that works with product configuration in a little bit, but I'll start by saying if, a, if you can get up to being suggestive, you're going to have trademark rights right away. But if your trademark is descriptive, then you need to show some secondary meaning in order for it to be protected. Um, happily, our law firm is very well known now as Debevoise and Plimpton. It's not just some law firm that was founded by a Debevoise person and a Plimpton, but it's actually a unique law firm. Vitamin Water has become a very well-known brand. Even though it is a water product that has vitamins, today it's, it's very well known. Um, and of course, with a generic mark, it can never be protected. So those are, the, th those are the key ways that we look at descriptive marks and how we can try to distinguish them from a generic term and from a term that's inherently distinctive. And I will talk a little later about how survey evidence can help make the distinction of whether a mark is descriptive or suggestive, whether it has secondary meaning. Um, and a lot of those issues came up in the famous Booking.com case that I litigated at the Supreme Court. Uh, but we'll turn to those survey questions a little later this afternoon. Yeah. James and Melo Panzanim. Moving on, Judge Mello. Off. There we go. So why are we so worried about descriptive marks? Well, there are two main reasons. One is because a descriptive mark simply doesn't act as a trademark should. It doesn't perform the essential function of a trademark. The second reason is much more practical, because if you give a large corporation a descriptive trademark, they can then use that as a weapon against smaller traders. And often the smaller trader can't afford to fight a big corporation. Uh, and <clears throat> as an example, I'll mention 
one of the first cases on Article 71C, as it was, in the EU trademark regulation that came before the Court of Justice of the European Union. It was the mark baby dry for nappies, okay? Now, a full court, I think then it was about nine or 12 judges, all elderly men decided that baby dry was distinctive for nappies. And you can just imagine another trader saying, my nappy will keep your baby dry. Now, that is a perfectly descriptive use, but could the owner of the trademark go after that small trader? Well, possibly, possibly not, but could they afford to fight it? Anyway, um, this is a long way of saying that there are two aspects to descriptive marks. One is whether they get on the register at all, and, and we've, I've set out in the booklet all the case law of the Court of Justice. And indeed, th what they've done over a series of cases is to lay down very similar rules to David, that, that David talked about from the US. So that um, in, in EU law, the, the, I suppose the descriptiveness has to be easily recognizable. And it, similarly, using some imagination, if the mark is elusive or suggestive, it's, it's then properly registrable. But the other aspect that we have to consider is the defense, a defense to using a descriptive term. As long as you use it in accordance with honest practices, then even if a mark has got on the register, then you, are, you don't infringe because, for example, if you say, my nappy will keep your baby dry, that's a, a perfectly innocent use in accordance with honest practices. So just like David, I always think about descriptive marks along the spectrum because you, ha you do have the highly distinctive marks. You have the uh, elusive and suggestive. And then there's this very difficult dividing line before you get to completely generic descriptive marks. And of course, I mean, Kodak is a very good example because Kodak originates for a time when you could establish a mark, make it distinctive through lots of trading. And since then, the product cycle has got very much shorter, which is why so many corporations now like to try and adopt descriptive marks because it gets the message across very quickly. And that's why I, when, I, when the new trademark directive was in, introduced in 1989, we had hundreds and hundreds of cases about distinctive, uh, non-distinctive descriptive marks coming through. And um, there were various respects in which the Court of First Instance or the Court of Justice went wrong and had to be uh, corrected by the, the main of the, the full court. So those are just uh, some of the issues uh, from a UK perspective about descriptive marks. And I, oh, yes, uh, my name is Kumiko Katsumoto. I'm a judge of intellectual property high court of Japan. And thank you for inviting this uh, conference. It's uh, really my pleasure. And Let's start my presentation. And I'd like to see how the legislation of Japan defines. And Article 3, Paragraph 1 of Trademark Act defines uh, what kind of marks cannot be registered. And let's see Item 3. It says, uh, consists solely of a mark indicating in a, com in a common manner, in the case of goods, the place of origin, place of sale, quality, raw materials, efficacy, intended purpose, shape, and the methods of futures, including time of production or use, quantity, price, or and I omit the following. And uh, it is thought the item three or, uh, of the, uh, the, the paragraph defines the descriptive mark. And, and descriptive mark may not be registered and the examiner must render a decision to the effect 
that the application involving descriptive marks is to be refused according to Article 15, Item 1 of Trademark Act. And the Supreme Court ruled in Waikiki case in 1978 that there are two grounds. One ground is public interest and another one is lack of distinctiveness. And if the uh, descriptive mark was inappropriately registered, what shall we do? At first, an interested person may file a request for a trial on the invalidation of the trademark registration. But there is a time limit. Uh, the request for a trial can be filed on, uh, within only five years of the date of registration. And second, in the litigation, an alleged infringer can assert invalidity defense. Uh, next, I, I, will exc uh, I will explain how the court determines whether a certain mark is descriptive or not. The mark is deemed as descriptive when the consumers or traders of the designated goods or services generally recognize that the trademark describes the goods or services with which the trademark uses at the point of an examiner's decision or the, at the point of trial decision. And this condition relates to the lack of distinctiveness of the mark. And the court also take into consider whether business operators wants to use the set mark uh, freely for the designated goods or services in the light of the uh, public interest. Uh, when the mark merely suggests or indirectly describes the features uh, of the goods or services, the mark is not descriptive. Uh, when they determine whether the mark is descriptive or only suggestive, the recognition of the consumers and traders is very important. Uh, for example, in, uh, the, in Honnama case, the word honnama does not have any meanings, describes the nature of goods according to the dictionaries, but the court found that honnama is descriptive because the consumers understood that it means uh, genuine and non, uh, not pasteurized when it is used with alcohol. Uh, and by examining uh, uh, many articles and commercials in magazines and newspapers. And yes, with regard to 3D mark, in Japan, 3D mark is entitled to trademark right by itself. However, it is thought that if the 3D mark consists solely of a three dimensional shape of goods or their packaging, which is indispensable for such goods or their packaging to properly function, it cannot be registered. And addition to that, even when the shape is not indispensable, uh, if the three team shapes are within a scope where it is predictable that the product of the same type would adapt the same for reasons of functionality or aesthetics of the product. And there are, there are no special circumstances to say that shapes are beyond the scope, that this 3D mark may not be registered. Uh, thank you. 다음은 후이수 판사님께 발표를 부탁드리겠습니다. Now, Judge Huisu. Judge Huisu, the floor is yours. Hello, please wait a moment. There's something wrong with my PPT. Sorry. Okay, and good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Sorry, sorry, sorry.
If you have difficulty pulling up the PPT, we can help you out with that. Can you see my screen? It's corrected. Yes, you can proceed now. We can see your PPT well. Okay. Okay. I'm so sorry. And good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Xu Hui. I'm a chief judge from Hainan Free Trade Court Intellectual Property Court. First of all, allow me to thank you for inviting us to participate in the 2022 International IP Court Conference. I really appreciate this opportunity to communicate with participants from other countries on our specific practices in descriptive mark distinctiveness through use and trademark surveyed evidence. I believe that we can learn from each other and achieve greater progress. As to today's topic, I should say that China has already constructed a sound legal system in which judicial practices have been well implemented so far. As for descriptive mark, Article 11 of China's trademark law stipulates that the following sites should not be used as trademarks. Here is the whole article. And besides this, in the trademark examination and review guidelines, enumerates several common types of sites that do not possess distinctiveness. The above mentioned marks lack the distinctiveness of a trademark because they directly indicate the common name, finger, or model of the goods used in the mark, or directly indicate the quality, may raw material, function, use, weight, quantity, and other characteristics of the goods, or contain the name of a place, which usually cannot distinguish the source of the goods or services. Moreover, such marks are often used by producers and operators in the relevant industry to describe their goods or services and should be used by the industry for common use, which is a public resources and should not be allowed to be used exclusively by a single company. Did you finish it? Sorry. Are you finished with your response, and Judge Huisu? No, no, sorry, sorry. Uh, I will continue. And to determine whether a work mark is a descriptive term for a particular good, the court will usually need to consider the following factors. One, the dictionary meaning of the term. Two, the actual use in which the term is used to describe the goods in question. Three, the ease with which the average consumer can associate the term with the attributes or characteristics of the goods in question. And four, the necessity for competitors to use the term to describe the goods in question. In practice, there are several points that require special attention. One, the term should be required to describe the attributes or characteristics of the goods to a certain level of commonness, generally based on the common understanding of the public of the particular goods. That's to say, the term should be a general expression of the attributes or characteristics of the goods. Two, the scope of descriptive marks should be limited to the goods or services for which the mark is actually used and should not be arbitrarily extended. As descriptive marks directly describe the characteristics of the goods for which 
they are used and lack distinctiveness. For example, just like Ms. Bernstein said just now, we think the word apple is a descriptive term for a fruit, but when associated with a mobile phone, it is distinctive and may be approved for registration. Three, if the applicant submits evidence that the term has been used for a long time, that consumers have actually associated it with a particular source and that the term objectively served as a distinct, distinguishing function, then the mark can be registered and protected. In the following, I will use a case study to illustrate in detail that descriptive marks can also be granted registration by gaining distinctiveness through use. And also, I need to mention that according to Article 59, the trademark owner cannot prohibit the legitimate use of such marks by others. Uh, that's all. Thank you. 네, 발표 감사합니다. 다음은 대한민국 사례에 관해서 본 보험 판사님께서 영어로 발표를 하겠습니다. Thank you. I'd like to begin with an episode concerning the Korean translation of the term descriptive mark. Descriptive mark is generally translated into 기술적 표장 in Korean, and the term, without further explanation, meanings like technical or technological directly comes up to ordinary Korean's mind. After seeing the poster for this conference, one of my colleagues asked me if this session was about technology. <laughs> but Gisurjak here means describing or narrative. Not all brands are created equal, but some brand names are inherently stronger than others. Borrowing the spectrum that David mentioned, we can assort some Korean brand names like this. From the bottom, generic terms like cafe latte for cafe latte cannot be trademarked. Although it might not make sense for non-Korean speakers, Hyundai in the name of the multinational automobile manufacturer means modern. So the name cannot be so the name can be classified as a descriptive term in Korea. Just like jail in CJ meaning the first or the best. Suggestive marks evoke the consumer's imagination and chamisul, meaning pure dew or genuine dew for Korean distilled liquor soju is a perfect example. The names of the two major Korean internet giants are good illustrations for the remaining two categories. Cacao pronounced and written the same in can be said as an arbitrary mark. Meanwhile, neighbor is a coin term combining the word navigate and the suffix er. We can call it a fanciful mark. Some marks step up the hierarchy by Englishizing or acronymizing the original name. For descriptive marks, I found out that this is very similar to that of Japan. Uh, Korean Trademark Act stipulates that a trademark consisting solely of marks indicating the feature of the goods in, co in a common manner is excluded from trademark registration. The provision enumerates representative examples of signifiers. Hong Sung in Hong Sung Hanu, Korean traditional beef, is an example of a place of production but the mark shown on the slide successfully was registered. It could be because of other graphical uh, elements, uh, such as the cartoon character making the mark rather distinctive or overall. Other examples are like this. Uh, quality as in Kungur Sanggyang, great text Bible. Kinopi, uh, meaning height elevating for shoes. Sujok Chim, uh, hand foot acupuncture. 
If a trademark only describes the feature of the product, the application for registration might be rejected, challenged, or invalidated. The Supreme Court ruled that unlike when applying for registration, if a descriptive mark is already registered, only such designated goods with reasons to be invalidated would be erased from the registration. I guess our distinguished guest uh, explained uh, much of how we, why we bar the registration of descriptive mark. Let's skip some of the slides. And how to determine whether a mark is merely descriptive or descriptive in a common manner, the Supreme Court presented a rule that if ordinary consumers can intuitively perceive the meaning or instinctively perceive that it's somehow describing the quality of the goods can be deemed descriptive. But if the mark's meaning can only be under understood after much consideration, we can tell that it's not descriptive. There are some examples. I will be brief on explaining this. Uh, so the court is carrying out a case by case analysis. In a case, the Supreme Court ruled that Tomatillo, uh, known as Mexican green tomato, was at least familiar among the traders dealing with Mexican food and not eligible for registration, even though the raw material was not very well known to ordinary Korean consumers. A 3D shape can also be regarded as descriptive if it is not perceived as a source identifier. Thank you. 네, 다음은 독일의 실무에 관해서 크리스티안 슈말츠 판사님의 동영상을 시청하겠습니다. About the case in Germany through the record of presentation. Ladies and gentlemen, I am very glad to add the German perspective to this first section on descriptive marks. Please allow me one preliminary remark. German trademark law is very much European trademark law. Hence, this field of the law is characterized not only by the jurisprudence of the Federal Court of Justice of Germany, but also by the Court of Justice of the European Union. As to the purpose of trademark related laws, I would like to cite from a judgment of the European Court. The essential function of the trademark is to guarantee the identity of the origin of the marked product to the consumer or end user by enabling him or her without any possibility of confusion to distinguish the product or service from others which have another origin. For the trademark to be able to fulfill its essential role in the system of undistorted competition, it must offer a guarantee that all the goods or services bearing it have originated under the control of a single undertaking which is responsible for their quality. In Germany, according to the relevant section of the Trademark Act, the following trademark, trademarks, descriptive trademarks, shall not be registered. Trademarks which consist exclusively of signs or indications which may serve in trade to designate the kind, quality, quantity, intended purpose, value, geographical origin, or the time of production of the goods or of rendering of the services or other characteristics of the goods or services. Let me add, the question of whether a mark is descriptive must be distinguished from the question of whether the mark serves a, as a distinctive mark. A lack of distinctiveness constitutes a different absolute ground for refusal, namely a trademark which is devoid of any distinctive character for the goods or services shall not be registered. Back to descriptive, descriptive signs. Signs and indications which may serve in trade to designate characteristics of the goods or services in respect of which registration is sought are by their very nature deemed unsuitable to fulfill the function performed by trademarks of an indication of origin. But this is without prejudice to the possibility provide, provided for in another section of the Trademark Act that they may become distinctive through use. But we will get to this question in a later section. The refusal to register descriptive signs also pursues an aim which is in the public interest, namely that descriptive signs or indications relating to the categories of goods or services in respect of which 
registration is applied for may be freely used by all, including as collective marks or as part of complex or graphic marks. Whether a sign or indication is descriptive shall be determined on the basis of the understanding of the relevant class of consumers being the intended customers or prospective customers of the goods or services for which the trademark is protected. This relevant public is composed of the trade and or the average consumer who is reasonably well informed and reasonably observant and circumspect. The view of the relevant public at the time of the application of the trademark is decisive. However, a future descriptive character of a sign has to be taken into account. The required prognosis is to be made on the basis of the understanding of the relevant consumer at the time of the application. An application must therefore be refused if it is already foreseeable at the time of the application that the sign will acquire a descriptive meaning for the goods or services in question in the future. As regards the standards for the de determination of the descriptive character of a sign, the description must be sufficiently direct. The evocation of mere associations or presumptions is not enough. In the Rhine Park Center Noise case decided by the Federal Court of Justice of Germany in 2011, the court stated that a sign is also descriptive if the indication establishes a close descriptive relationship to the goods or services claimed and therefore justifies the assumption that the public will grasp the descriptive content of the term as such without further ado and without ambiguities. Let me now introduce you to a recent decision of the Federal Court of Justice, namely the decision Black Friday decided on 27 March 2021. This case concerned the trademark Black Friday, which had been registered in 2013 for a variety of goods and services in classes 9, 35 and 41. Invalidity proceedings were filed. The German Patent and Trademark Office ordered the complete cancellation of the trademark for lack of distinctiveness at the time of application for registration, as well as at the time of the decision. The Federal Patent Court partly dismissed the invalidity proceedings. Regarding a number of services in Class 35, inter alia wholesale services via the Internet in the areas of electrical and electronic goods. However, the appeal of the trademark owner was dismissed. This decision was upheld by the Federal Court of Justice. The Federal Patent Court rightly assumed that it is sufficient for the ground for refusal to be upheld if the sign in question has no descriptive meaning at the time of filing, but it is already foreseeable at the time of filing that the sign will acquire a descriptive meaning for the goods or services in question in the future. There were sufficient indications at the time of filing that the designation Black Friday would in the future become a catchword for a discount campaign in the trade in electrical and electronic goods in Germany. So far for descriptive marks, thank you very much for your attention. 네, 지금까지 기술적 표장에 관한 각국의 실무를 들었습니다. 김영기 판사님께서 실무를 바탕으로 해서 영어로 질의를 하겠습니다. I appreciate all the great presentation from the speakers. Before I start my question, I have a statement for the audience. When I refer to a reference book, it means this book, 표지법에 관한 비교법적 연구. I'll try to let you know the relevant pages about the question. Okay, now I'd like to begin the question with Professor Bonstein. Is it okay for you? Yes. Thank you. Okay, the first question is about the descriptive fair use defense. As you mentioned, the US Lanham Act allows a descriptive mark that has a quite distinctiveness or secondary meaning to be registered. Meanwhile, the users of the mark may still attempt the descriptive fair use defense in the litigation as well. I have two questions about this one. Uh, why does the U.S. law allow the descriptive fair use defense even after the registration of descriptive marks? 
Second, would you address the descriptive mark fair use defense that the defendant bears the burden of proof in more detail, particularly about how to determine whether the defendant used descriptive words fairly and in good faith to describe their goods, but not as a trademark? Could you? Well, thank you for those perceptive questions, which show that you spent quite some time reading the materials I submitted. I think that James actually gave the perfect example for the first question uh, with the baby dry case. And we do recognize that some brand names can become extremely well known over time. I had the pleasure of flying Korean Air to come to, uh, to Korea uh, uh, just uh, yesterday, which is hard to believe. Um, and you know, if you start with the trademark Korean Air, well, it just could be any airline that serves the Korea. Uh, uh, just like uh, European airline, it could be any airline that serves Europe. But over time, we've come to recognize that when I say Korean Air, I actually don't mean any airline that operates in Korea. I mean a specific brand name. However, that should not give the trademark owner the right to stop other people from using that term fairly to describe what they're doing. Otherwise, you would be giving a monopoly on language. And that's why I agree with James that if another trader wants to say our nappies, or as we'd say in America, our, our diapers will keep your baby dry, that, sh that should be permitted. However, we do recognize, to get to the second question, that we don't want to allow people in bad faith to try to undermine a competitor by purposefully undermining their trademark rights. And so for that reason, when we do allow someone to make a fair use reference of something like Baby Dry, we would require that they do it in good faith. For example, we wouldn't want an ad that says in very tiny letters, our nappies will keep your, and then have giant letters, Baby Dry. Mm -hmm. Because that could be confusing. We wouldn't want that trader to use the logo of the plaintiff in presenting the words baby dry. So we want to make sure that they're using those terms fairly, in good faith, just to describe what they're doing, and not in a bad faith effort to try to uh, cause confusion uh, or cause harm to the brand. Um, th the very last part of that is that you can't be using it yourself as a trademark. Um, so you couldn't yourself then try to register Baby Dry as a brand name. You have to be using it in sort of plain language in the text of the copy and not in a way that's trying to designate the source of your own goods. Those are, those are the reasons why we still have the descriptive fair use defense in the United States. I appreciate your great explanation. Now I can move to Judge James Miller. Just next to you, okay. This question is very just simple, but general. Uh, this question is about uh, protection of shape of goods in IP field. The reference book, page number 146. How does it differ in terms of requirements and the effect from where a shape of goods is protected by the trademark law or on the copyright, design right, etc.? I think you handle this question in the prior session, but please explain it more in more detail. Okay. Um, maybe I'll, I'll give you an example, because I once acted for KitchenAid. Um, they have a famous shape of food mixer. It's quite old-fashioned, but very well known. And what they, what they tried to do was to protect this shape with a trademark. So the trademark consisted of the shape of the food mixer with small letters KitchenAid across the front. And of course, the distinctive part of the, the trademark was the name KitchenAid. Uh, unfortunately, we failed to stop a rival manufacturer producing uh, quite a similar shape of uh, food mixer because that shape wasn't distinctive. So it, that's a way of illustrating that trademark protection and design protection have different purposes. 
So if you try and protect a shape as a trademark, it's got to be distinctive. Whereas if you try and protect a shape of a product through a design, right, you're protecting the shape of the product. Um, I think I'll, I'll just mention perhaps one other example. Um, no, we probably haven't got enough time, so I'll stop. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for your considerate answer. Now, now I think uh, the audience can guess who will be the next. <laughs> okay, Japan. Yeah, this question is about source, sources for barbecued meat case. Uh, reference book, page number 148. I want to ask some questions about the interesting 3D mark case, the sources for barbecued meat case. In this case, IP High Court of Japan stipulated that the three dimensional shapes constituting the applied trademark are within a scope where it is predictable that a product of the same type would adopt the same for reasons of functionality or aesthetics of the product. And there are no special circumstances for sufficiently acknowledging that the shapes are beyond such scope. Here the question goes, could you elaborate on the meaning of this decision? The statements by the court reminds me of the so-called doctrine of aesthetic functionality in the US. That is, if exclusive use of the feature, feature would put competitors at a significant non-reputation related disadvantage, then the aesthetic feature is functional and the trade dress cannot be protected. May be understood that the IP High Court of Japan decided in the case that the distinctiveness of three-dimensional mark shall be determined strictly under a legal principle similar to the doctrine of aesthetic principle. Judge Kachimata? <laughs> Thank you for your question. And, um, uh, unfortunately, I'm not familiar with the doctrine of aesthetics. I, I have to <laughs> learn from the aesthetic functionality. I, I understand that uh, the way of thinking is uh, similar to those criteria of the Japanese court. And the criteria used in the uh, sources for barbecue meat case is widely adapted. Uh, when we, uh, we uh, the judges, uh, examine the shape from the perspective of functionality and aesthetics of the product. And, uh, uh, but in Japan, the court does not see if the uh, exclusive use puts competitors at the significant non-reputation related disadvantage or not, uh, but just see whether the competitors normally wants to use the shape from the view of functionality and aesthetics. So uh, in, my, in my point of view, maybe it is uh, easier to find 3D mark descriptive in Japan the US, than the US, but uh, I'm not sure. Um, yeah, that's all. Thank you. Thank you. Professor Bernstein, could you add something? I'll start by saying that many judges in the United States don't understand the doctrine of aesthetic functionality either. <laughs> and it's a very controversial doctrine. Um, the Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit, which covers California and some of the other Western states, uh, had a controversial decision involving Redbubble. Uh, and we had hoped the US Supreme Court would take that case to provide some clarity, but they did not. Uh, and so we still have some ways to go to understand the doctrine better. But the idea is that if you are um, designing a, a product in a way or using a trademark, not for its source identifying qualities, but rather because um, aesthetically you want to present it, that should be allowed. So for example, there was a case involving uh, patterns of China and uh, one court said that you can, another trader can make the same pattern because in a hotel, they might need to replace some broken pieces of China and they don't want to have to go back to the original manufacturer to have a set that would look nice on the table. Um, I myself actually think that that's problematic because you may very well uh, be 
passing those off as coming from the first manufacturer if it was a distinctive look, if it was a distinctive pattern. So the doctrine of aesthetic functionality is, as I said, controversial. Um, uh, and we could do an entire day just on that, but uh, we don't have time for it. Okay. Thank you, that's it. 네, 이상으로 기술적 표장에 관한 논의를 마치고 that, 두 번째 uh, 토픽인 to the end of the descriptive marks and let's move on to section 2 on distinctiveness through use. We will follow the same uh, method as the first section. We will start with Professor Bernstein and hear responses from the panel. Excellent. Okay, so now we're getting to uh, the question, let me just advance these slides, of distinctiveness. Um, and here we're going to start with the notion that you have a descriptive trademark. And, and to Judge Katsumata's point, it can be 3D as well that's descriptive. Indeed, the U.S. Supreme Court has said that a, um, a product configuration is never inherently uh, distinctive. You must show a secondary meaning. You must show that it has a source identifying element. So I'll start by focusing on acquisition of distinctiveness rights. And uh, one of the leading treatises in the United States on trademark law is by Professor McCarthy. So this is from his book on the elements of how you would acquire distinctiveness. And we do look at two types of evidence. We look at direct evidence of distinctiveness, and we look at circumstantial evidence. So direct evidence could be, for example, statements by consumers. Um, or, and, and we can measure that through surveys, or we can measure it by actually having consumers come in and testify or provide uh, declarations. Uh, so for example, it could be people saying, I know Korean Airlines is a brand. It's not just any Korean airline. Um, whereas if we were talking about European Airlines, well, there's no one European airline. There's Air France, there's British Airways, there's KLM. They are all European airlines. There, consumers don't see the term European airlines as being a, a source identifier. Rather, it's just a descriptive term for a variety of different airlines. And then we can look at circumstantial evidence as well. Uh, and as Professor McCarthy points out, that could be evidence of how long you've used that trademark. What have your sales been? Um, what is the advertising that you do of that trademark? Um, it's very powerful, for example, to put in evidence showing that, that a manufacturer calls out the element. For example, we have a, a brand of fiberglass insulation in the United States made by Owens Corning, and it's unusually pink. There's no reason that fiberglass has to be pink. Um, a single color in the United States can never be inherently distinctive. There was a Federal Circuit case just last year that said a combination of two colors might be inherently distinctive, but a single color is never. So what does Owens Corning do? To advertise their fiberglass, they use the cartoon character, the Pink Panther, and they tell people, look for the pink fiberglass. In their advertising, they highlight the color, they highlight that element of their product, and that helps show that there's secondary meaning. So courts can look at all of those different elements in, de in deciding whether or not you've shown that you've acquired uh, distinctiveness. So here's just an example. If I say something is a best buy, that's on its own descriptive. But after a certain uh, manufacturer has advertised it a lot here, it's a, a retail store in the United States called Best Buy, people have come to recognize that's a place where you can go to buy electronics, uh, for example. Um, this is the case in the U.S. Supreme Court that deals with product configuration and trade dress. And here, the Supreme Court said that you must show secondary meaning. So this dealt with these appliques, these patches put on babies' dresses. Uh, Walmart copied the look of a dress that was produced by Samara Brothers. Samara Brothers challenged them. Um, here, Wal Walmart went to court for a declaration that their dress wasn't infringing, and the Supreme Court said that the burden was on some Arab brothers to actually you know, come forward with evidence showing that they had acquired secondary meaning, that people didn't see those appliques as just being a nice ornamental element to the dress, but rather that they actually signified source. Now, just like you can acquire distinctiveness, so can you lose it. Of course, one way to lose trademark rights is just to abandon your trademark, but that's losing trademark rights in the entire trademark.
but there are ways of still having your trademark and losing the distinctiveness of it. And one, uh, one way of doing that is through naked licensing. I'm not sure if that's a term that's used in, in other countries, but in the United States, naked licensing is when you license the trademark and you have no quality control at all. You can let them do whatever they want with that trademark. And the reason that can lead to loss of distinctiveness is that we no longer have the very promise of a trademark. The promise of a trademark is that there's one source behind it and that you know that the quality will be consistent. It might not be good quality. I don't think a McDonald's hamburger is very good at all, but if you walk into a McDonald's anywhere in the world, you know what you'll be getting. You're getting a consistent quality. If you practice naked licensing, and in this case, um, the court found that this video, game, uh, this video store had allowed other stores to use the exact same name without having any oversight or quality control, that can lose to the loss of, of distinctiveness. And then the other major uh, topic I'll cover before I pass it on is that you can lose distinctiveness if your trademark becomes generic. This is actually an advertisement that was run by Xerox um, back when Xerox was a powerful trademark for photocopy machines. Um, and, uh, and Xerox wanted to make sure that people didn't allow its trademark to become generic. And so they have this graveyard of other, of other trademarks, trademarks like Escalator and Linoleum and Trampoline that once were trademarks, but over time, the brand owners didn't protect those names and other people started using them. And so it got to the point where anybody who made a bouncing device for their children to jump on in the backyard would call it a trampoline. It no longer meant it came from a particular brand. And so Xerox ran these ads saying, please don't use our word as a generic term. Say you want to make a photocopier. Um, Xerox is our brand name. Um, most recently, there was a very amusing video by the in-house lawyers for the company that makes Velcro. Uh, and they sang a whole song about how Velcro is their trademark. And please don't use Velcro as a generic term. Uh, we don't have time, though, to see that video today. Judge Guan prepared. Actually, I included that in my slide. <laughs> yeah, okay. So um, we talked a little earlier about passing off and uh, the use of a descriptive term. And of course, the, David referred to a secondary meaning in other words, the meaning has changed from a, dis a purely descriptive meaning to one which indicates trade origin. And indeed, in passing off, the, uh, the notion of a secondary meaning was, was uh, laid down as long ago as 1896 in a case called camel hair belting. Because although the plaintiff's belting was made of camel hair, people had come to associate the, ter the term with products of the claimant's manufacture. Now, what has this got to do with acquired distinctiveness? Well, it's the same concept. It's just a different term. Uh, so how do, you, uh, how do you demonstrate you've got acquired distinctiveness? Now, for some marks, simple word mark, it's relatively easy because you put forward lots of evidence of your massive turnover lots of evidence of advertising. And provided you've used the term as a trademark, that's probably going to be enough to persuade people, or the, a court, that you have acquired distinctiveness. Uh, and w w one other thing that David mentioned, which uh, I, I also um, think is important, for some marks, the, the trademark owner actually uses the mark continues to use the mark in a descriptive way, in which case you don't, you're not, you're not, you're not going to be able to prove acquired distinctiveness. So one of the key questions, and this is particularly important when you've got a whole series of marks on a product. So you may have a house mark like Kellogg's, then you may have the name of the product. And if, if they've trademarked the name of the product, you've got to look to see, are they using it as a trademark? 
in other uh, and or do they have the confidence to use that term as a trademark without the house mark uh, and sometimes people don't have the confidence to use the term as a trademark on its own and again that's a key indicator that it hasn't acquired distinctiveness um, now in in the reference book i've set out all the the materials based on our trademarks act which is uh, and all of those matters are derived from the trademark directive. Uh, the, uh, moving on to loss, David talked about naked licensing. That's quite a controversial uh, way to lose trademark rights in the UK. Uh, if, if you don't exercise any quality control at all, then you're likely to lose your trademark. The other uh, way that David mentioned is also part of EU law, genericide. Um, there are lots of, lots of examples, in the, in, even in the old cases, uh, of marks that were once proper registered trademarks. And because the trademark owner failed to police infringements, they lost the trademark right. Now, that doesn't mean you've got to go after everybody, but it does mean that it, in a sense, you couldn't call it a death by a thousand cuts. If you don't stop the main infringers and you just let, uh, let people continue to use your mark, it will eventually lose its, its source origin message and it'll just become the name of the goods. I mean, for example, shredded wheat. I don't, uh, you may not know this as a breakfast cereal. It's quite well known in the UK. But shredded wheat was originally produced under a patent. <laughs> and after the patent expired, it continued as a trademark. But eventually, it became generic, at least in the UK, because so many people produced the same type of breakfast cereal after the patent had expired. So that's a lesson for trademark owners. If you, if you have a monopoly, either through a patent or a design, uh, which relates to your trademark. You've got to be very careful once the monopoly right ex expires to stop the name of the patented or registered design protected product becoming generic. Uh, Judge uh, Kumiko Kazumata, the floor is yours. Okay, uh, I'd like to explain about uh, distinctiveness uh, through use. In Japan, the Trademark Act adopts first to file system, so the applicant can file an application before it starts to use the mark. Actually, it is uh, generally recommended to file an application for trademark before you start the business in Japan in, uh, in general. However, there is an exception. A mark without distinctiveness may be registered if customers are able to recognize the goods or services as those pertaining to a business of a particular person as a result of the use of the trademark. So if you want to register an indistinctive mark, uh, indistinctive mark as a trademark, you have to start to use the mark and obtain the recognition of consumers before you file an application. And here in this is in distinctive marks includes descriptive marks. And uh, uh, what is the requirement to obtain distinctiveness through use? According to Article 3, Paragraph 2 of Trademark Act, the mark should be well known to the extent that consumers can recognize it as marks representing certain products or services relating to a business of a particular person. In addition to that, according to the precedence, the mark should be well known uh, throughout Japan. Uh, here is a case involving 3D mark named Jean Paul Gaultier classic case. Uh, you can see the designated 3D mark on the slide. It is the shape of a bottle for perfume. And 
IP High Court held that whether or not a trademark consisting of a three-dimensional shape has acquired the capa capability to distinguish one goods from others should be determined by comprehensively taking into consideration uh, whether or not there are other goods uh, whose shape is identical or similar to the shape of the trademark and the circumstances concerning the use of the trademark, such as the period, uh, period of time when the trademark has been in use, the volume of sales of the goods, and the period of time and scale of the advertisement of the goods. This criteria also applies when the court determines whether a mark gained distinctiveness irrespectively of the type of the mark. In this case, the court uh, admitted that the distinctiveness of the mark taking into account the fact that the plaintiff has used the mark more than 15 years and it has been uh, frequently appeared in magazines. Next topic is succession of acquired distinctiveness. In my point of view, it seems to be difficult to succeed the acquired distinctiveness because the mark should be well known to the extent that consumers can recognize it as marks representing certain products or services relating to a business of a particular person according, according to the provision of trademark act, uh, trademark act. And uh, uh, about the uh, scope of recognition. When the mark acquired distinctiveness, the same mark or substantially same mark can be registered. Uh, please note that if a mark constitutes the shape, uh, the color, or the sound, which is indispensable to guarantee the technique, uh, technical functionality of the designated goods or packaging thereof, it cannot be registered even when the consumer recognizes the goods or services as those pertaining to a business of a particular person as a result of the use of the trademark. It is exception of distinctiveness through use. Uh, next, effect of distinctiveness acquisition. Once it is registered, it can exercise the trademark right in its enti uh, entirety. Uh, next, loss of distinctiveness uh, through use. In some cases, the mark may lose its distinctiveness. Uh, in precedence, the court seems to determine whether the mark has lost the uh, distinctiveness, taking into consideration the practical situation under whether the, ma uh, whether, uh, under where the mark used by the third parties, how long the third parties used the mark. The explanation of the set, mark, set word in these dictionaries, how the mark described in the books or magazines, whether the trader and consumers recognize the mark as a common word. Uh, when you think the registered trademark uh, have already lost its uh, distinctiveness, you can request for a trial on the invalidation before JPO. And uh, in the trademark infringement case, uh, a legit infringer can assert the invalidity defense or abuse of rights. Uh, that's all. 네, 다음은 중국의 후이수 판사님께 발표를 Next is Judge Huisu from China. So, please. Elaborated in the trademark law by countries, it's stipulated in Article N and Article 9 of Chinese trademark law. In our opinion, the distinctiveness of trademark is dynamic, take acquisition and loss, and should be objectively determined case by case. I will use Xiao Guan Cha trema is a typical example to illustrate how to acquire distinctiveness through use. 
a company filed an invalidation action against this trademark holder, claiming that in this mark, cha is the abbreviation of teat. Xiaoguan usually refers to the package of products, and Xiaoguan cha does literally means tea package in small cans. Such a mark, while not inherently distinctive, usually cannot be registered on the ground there. It merely directly indicates the main raw materials, the package of products, and incapable of identifying the corresponding goods or services. National Intellectual Property Administration, hearing after referred to as CNIPA, held that there are sufficient evidence proving that consumers have come to recognize the Xiaoguan Cha as an indicator of goods after long term publicity and use. Therefore, in this scenario, CNIPA made the decision to maintain the registration of the disability mark. Then the company filed a lawsuit to Beijing Intellectual Property Court against CNIPA's decision. Beijing IP Court determined that, based on public information, Xiaoguan Cha Company has invested 260 million yuan in advertising for the trademark and set up more than 600. 600 stores in many provinces and cities across the country. In combination with the evidence submitted by Xiao Guan Cha, such as the authorized distribution agreements, the order lists, the sales statistic sheets, the product rebuilds, the advertisement production contracts, invoices, and the relevant advertisements served on various media the library search reports issued by the China National Library, the planning of large-scale publicity activities, the audit reports, and various owner certificates, which included evidence regarding protection of Xiao Guan Cha trademark rights. The court held that the trademark has enjoyed a relatively high reputation and has established a relatively stable connection with Xiao Guan Cha company through extensive publicity and use, and could obtain distinctiveness, so the disputing mark could be registered as a trademark. In this judgment, which is now in effect, the court elaborated that the following factors should be taken into consideration when judging whether the trademark has achieved distinctiveness through use. One, the way the mark is actually used its effect, its law. In other words, whether it is used in the manner of trademark. Two, the time, region, and scope of consecutive use of the mark, as well as the sales score and other business information of the make holder. Three, the recognition of the trademark by the relevant public. Four, other significant factors of the trademark through use. In general, the examination and judgment of whether the trademark have obtained distinctiveness through use should be based on the actual scenario where the trademark submitted for registration. However, if the parties have sufficient evidence to prove that the trademark has indeed obtained distinctiveness through actual and effective use after the application date, from the perspective of saving judicial resources and protecting the legitimate rights and interests of the parties, the evidence after the application date of trademark registration in dispute should also be considered. That's all. Thank you. 네, 감사합니다. 다음은 권봉 판사님께서 발표. Moving on to Judge Bon Kwon. 전체적으로 시간이 10분 이상. We are uh, 10 minutes delayed in our schedule, so please keep to the time. Five minutes for your responses. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, it doesn't allow me to monopolize the mic. <laughs> uh, basically, Korean trademark system can be considered as a first-to-file system, but some provisions are based on the first-to-use principle and acquisition and loss by use can be uh, uh, included in that uh, category. The, 
The Korean Trademark Act uh, prescribes that a descriptive mark, a conspicuous geographical name or a common surname or name may be registered if it is perceived to indicate the source of good as a result of using the trademark. And uh, in a recent case on uh, Seoul National uh, American University case, uh, the Supreme Court in an Ang Bank case uh, re explain that uh, Seoul National University can be trademarked because it, it's acquired secondary meaning of conspicuous geographical name. The Supreme Court enumerated factors to be considered when determining distinctiveness, uh, duration of use, uh, the frequency and continuity of use, quantity of production and sales, market share, uh, how uh, the method, frequency, period for its advertisement and promotion, etc. cetera. Uh, acquisition and loss of distinctiveness is a question of fact. The, the more abundant the evidence are submitted, the more likely acquired distinctiveness would be recognized. And the enforcement regulation of the Trademark Act and the KIPO manual provides a helpful list of possible evidence. Here are some uh, example Larry decisions by the Supreme Court. In the Viagra case, a Supreme Court ruled that Pfizer's uh, trademark of uh, shape of the peel consisted solely of a mark indicating the shape, but acquired distinctiveness through use. The acquisition of distinctiveness is not recognized for similar marks or similar goods or services. And the trademark which acquired distinctiveness can fully enjoy the right. That is, it can prevail over similar marks or similar goods or services. Let's now move on to the loss of distinctiveness. Uh, the Trademark Act says that if a trademark becomes a generic term or a commonly used mark, it cannot claim its right and may be invalidated. Bayer's trademark, Aspirin, was declared generic in 1977, as in the United States. And Jeep was declared generic in 1992. Note that Aspirin is still a trademark name in about 80 countries. So it, it can differ from country to country. Because it's to deprive a right from the holder, careful consideration should be given and the course of trade at the relevant market at the time of decision is considered. Here's an example of uh, loss of distinctiveness. Uh, trademarks once thought to have lost distinctiveness through use can regain their distinctiveness over time. For example, in Korea, Dail Band has been used as a common name for a bandage, just like Band-Aid in the United States. However, with competitors coming up with other fancy versions and Dail Band losing its market share, the trademark took back its function as a source indicator. Sadly and ir ironically enough, young people like my daughter, soon to be five years old, even didn't have a chance to hear the name. When determining distinctiveness, the right holder's efforts are considered critical, such as demanding competitors stop using the mark or requesting corrections to how the mark is mentioned in media. And now it's the time to watch the video clip that David mentioned. Uh, <laughs> this is an excerpt from a YouTube video by the legal team of Velcro. Asking you not to say the name we took 60 plus years to build. But if you keep calling these Velcro shoes, our trademark will get killed. Yeah! We aren't just doing this for us. We're doing it for all the successful brands that got so popular, people started using the brand names the wrong way. So please remember. If you need something to clean up your socks, do it with bleach and not with Clorox. <laughs> if you have blood from a poop or you made, 
Band-Aid. Isn't it hilarious? <laughs> I, I recommend you to watch the full version of it. And uh, there are uh, the Beyond the Scene uh, videos and uh, other the, the epilogue to that. So they are all uh, worth watching. 네. Series of uh, patent court cases, Alaragang, famous for Botox, a drug which reduces skin wrinkles, could successfully invalidate the registered trademark Bonotox thanks to its effort to manage its trademark. Thanks. That's all. 네. <웃음> 다음은 독일의 Moving on, we will watch the record uh, presentation of Judge Christian Schmaltz. It will be seven minutes. Ladies and gentlemen, I will now cover some aspects of the second section regarding the issue of distinctiveness through use and will for this purpose, first of all, refer to the famous 1999 Kimsey judgment of the Court of Justice of the European Union. The European Court held that in determining whether a mark has acquired distinctive character following the use made of it, the competent authority must make an overall assessment of the evidence that the mark has come to identify the product concerned as originating from a particular undertaking and thus to distinguish that product from goods of other undertakings. In assessing the distinctive character of a mark, the following may be taken into account. The so-called famous Kimsey criteria. The market share the, held by the mark, how intensive, geographically widespread and long-standing the use of the mark has been, the amount invested by the undertaking in promoting the mark, the proportion of the relevant class of persons who, because of the mark, identify goods as originating from a particular undertaking, and statements from chambers of commerce and industry or other trade and professional associations. I will come back to these Kimsey criteria later on. If, on the basis of those factors, the competent authority finds that the relevant class of persons, or at least a significant proportion thereof, identify goods as originating from a particular undertaking because of the trademark, it must, it must hold that the requirement for registering the mark is satisfied. However, the circumstances in which that requirement may be regarded as satisfied cannot be shown to exist solely by reference to general abstract data such as predetermined percentages. As regards the method to be used to assess the distinctive character of a mark in respect of which registration is applied for, the competent authority may, where it has particularly difficulty in that connection, have recourse to an opinion poll as guidance for its judgment. The point in time for determining whether such requirements are met is the time of application for registration of the sign. Only if the trademark at issue has acquired a distinctive character before the date of filing may it escape the application of one or more of the grounds of invalidity. However, account may be taken of evidence which, although subsequent to the date of filing, enables the drawing of conclusions on the situation as it was on that date. In order to be able to take into account an assertion of distinctiveness which occurred after the date of filing, the seniority of the application must be deferred. If the trademark did not meet the requirements for registration at the time of filing, but the ground for refusal no longer applies subsequent to the date of filing, the application may not be refused if the applicant declares his agreement that, regardless of the original date of filing and of any priority claimed, the date on which the ground for refusal ceased to apply is deemed to be the date of filing and is relevant for the purpose of establishing seniority. It follows that the registration of a descriptive sign with the priority of the filing date requires a distinctiveness through use at that time. 
Once the, the distinctiveness through use has been proven and thus been established, established, the obstacle to protection is overcome and the sign is registered. There are no special regulations as regards the scope of protection of such signs. Rather, the protection which the registration by virtue of acquired distinctiveness confers on the trademark proprietor is no weaker than that of a trademark which was registered on the basis of original distinctiveness. In assessing the distinctive character of a mark in respect of which registration has been applied for, the so-called and already mentioned Keemsey criteria should be taken into account. Since an overall assessment of the particular circumstances of the case must always take place, it cannot be said that any particular evidence is more important than the other. However, opinion polls or consumer surveys will usually provide the simplest and most reliable evidence of an acquisition of distinctiveness through use. Therefore, according to the established case law of the Federal Court of Justice, consumer surveys are regularly to be considered for determining the consumer's expectations, at least in complex factual situations. I would, not, I would now like to refer to one recent case of the Federal Court of Justice regarding the acquisition of distinctiveness through use, namely the case Gold Bunny 3 of July 2021. This case concerned infringement proceedings in which the plaintiffs claimed that the golden color of the wrapping of their chocolate Easter bunny had acquired public recognition as a trademark through its use in trade. The Court of Appeal had dismissed the infringement claim. The appeal on points of law was successful. Taking into account the consumer survey submitted by the plaintiffs, they have proven that the shade of gold of the gold bunny claimed by them has acquired public recognition as a trademark for chocolate bunnies within the relevant public within the meaning of Section 4, Number 2 Trademark Act. For this, a degree of assignment of more than 50% is sufficient. Let me now say a few words regarding the loss of distinctiveness through use. The later loss of distinctiveness does not in itself lead to the loss of the trademark right. The mere loss of distinctiveness does not justify the assumption of a transformation of the trademark into a generic designation. However, if the sign has actually become the common name in the trade of goods or services in respect of which it is registered, the registration shall be revoked and cancelled upon application. There are several statutory provisions which address the situation in which the trademark is no longer capable of fulfilling its function as an indication of origin. The provisions relate to the situation where the trademark has become the common name and has therefore lost its distinctive character with the result that it no longer fulfills that function. The perception of the relevant public is decisive for the development of a trademark into a common term. The determination of such development is subject to strict requirements and is to be affirmed only if a completely insignificant part of the target public still sees an indication of origin in the sign. The mere fact that the trademark is also used with a certain frequency in a descriptive manner does not justify the assumption that it has become a common term. Thank you very much for your attention. 네, 다음은 김영기 판사님께서 Now, uh, Judge Kim Young-gi will pose his questions okay. to individual panelists. Uh, this time the question goes to Judge Kachimata again. <laughs> Sorry, Judge Kwon. Most audiences are familiar with Korean practices. Okay, Judge Kachimata, in the question, okay, this question is about succession of acquired distinctiveness. Uh, reference book, page number 165. In the question and response, you answered if the assignee succeeds the whole business relating to the products or service for which the original user used the mark and gained distinctiveness of the mark, the judge can consider the actual use of the mark by the original user in deciding whether the said mark has acquired distinctiveness through use. However, if the assignee obtained only the mark but the business, the judge cannot take into account of the use of the mark by the original user in deciding the distinctiveness. I think this part is very interesting. 
because uh, it seems a little different from other countries' practice. So could you elaborate on the last part, which seems different from other countries' practice? So, I mean, why do you in Japan treat the case differently between the succession of whole business and obtaining only the mark in deciding the distinctiveness? You want it? Yeah. Okay. So. <laughs> Thank you for your question. And I would like to explain from the, art, uh, the uh, uh, trademark law. According to the Article 3, Paragraph 2 of the Trademark Act in Japan, in order to mark obtain the distinctiveness through use, it should be well known to the extent that the consumers can recognize it as marks representing certain, certain products and services relating to a business of a particular person. So it means the distinctiveness should connect with a certain business of a, uh, of a particular person. So when the assignee obtained only the trademark uh, right, but the business, including the products or services, uh, which the trademark uses, the distinctiveness of the mark is tied to a particular person. So I mean the, the original user. So, and it does not have any relation with the assignee. So that's, it is not appropriate to take into account of the use of the mark by the original user in deciding the distinctiveness of the mark after succession. Okay, because of lack of time, I'll stop here. Thank you. 네, 이제 마지막 토픽인 and we will move on to the last topic on surveys. Please keep your responses to five minutes and uh, responses to questions to two minutes. We will start with Professor Bernstein. Thank you. So we could spend five hours on surveys. So I'm going to just introduce the topic very briefly but there's much more material in, in, the, uh, in the book. So first I'll start with what the standards are for surveys. Surveys are used in trademark cases very extensively in the United States, uh, and they have been for over 50 years. So I think we have a very well-developed jurisprudence around surveys. And uh, we've learned a lot from the uh, statisticians in the world about how to conduct surveys in a way that will be relevant to evidence that we can rely on. Um, these are seven of the factors that courts often look to. Uh, this is published by the U.S. Federal Judicial Center um, to help educate judges uh, who may not be as familiar with statistics uh, to understand what they should be looking at. You want to make sure that you've got the right population of people in the survey, that the people in the survey are representative of that population. For example, if you're doing a survey about yogurt, you want to make sure that the people you're surveying actually eat yogurt. Um, uh, if you're doing surveys about um, uh, beef sauces for beef, you don't want to have vegetarians in your survey because they're not likely to buy uh, sauces for beef, for example. Um, so these are, these are those uh, factors courts look at. And I, what I'd like to do is very briefly talk about some of the different types of surveys uh, that have been done. So one type of survey that we look at very frequently deals with whether or not a trademark is generic. And we've talked about that today because if a trademark is generic or if a term is generic, it can never be a trademark. On the other hand, if it's perceived as an identifier of source as not being the genus of the thing, then it can be protected. And the very famous case is the Booking.com case, uh, which I mentioned we litigated two years ago in the US Supreme Court. And here there was a survey, and the results showed that when you asked people about different uh, names, um, is it a brand name or is it a common name, the brand name for Booking.com was 75% of consumers identified Booking.com as being a brand name. And they, and they identified these other terms, Pepsi and E-Trade and Shutterfly, as being brand names as well. In contrast, when you look at some other things like supermarket or sporting goods, they recognize that those are common names. And to try to make sure that we were not confusing people by having a .com, the survey included washingmachine.com, and 33% of people thought it was a brand name, 67% thought it was a common name, 
And so the court found this persuasive to show that consumers could fairly understand the difference between brand names and common names. And this evidence, the Supreme Court said, was very important evidence in showing that booking.com is not generic. We also can look at secondary meaning or acquired distinctiveness. This was a case we handled for vitamin water some years ago. And here the question is, do consumers think that products with this name come from one company or more than one company? Uh, for example, if I use the Korean Air example that I talked about before, if I said, do you associate Korean Air with airline services from one company or more than one company, I think the vast majority of people would say one company. That would show its acquired secondary meaning. If I ask, do you associate European Air or European Airlines with one company or more than one company, I think most people would recognize that there's more than one company with whom they identify the term European Air and therefore it would not have secondary meaning. Finally, we look at likelihood of confusion. And surveys are used to show confusion quite a lot. Some of you may be familiar with um, this logo that I have next to the name Grubhub. Grubhub is a US company, but uh, it's owned by um, a Dutch company called uh, Jet, just, just eat takeout, I think. And they use the same logo in many of their brands around the world. Um, here, we did a survey to show that it did not cause confusion with the logo for Home Chef. And the questions that were in the survey are shown here. This is so-called the EverReady survey. It's based on a case involving the trademark EverReady, where you only show one mark. You just show the Grubhub mark and say, who do you think this comes from? And no one said Home Chef. A second type of confusion survey is from a case called Squirt. Here, you show the products, uh, we show it in an array, and then you show the one product that you're testing and say, was this one of the products you saw before? Um, and the idea is to see whether or not people recognize the similarity. So I could go into more detail. If you're interested in the actual survey report in the booking.com case or the Grubhub case, we've actually provided that to the patent court, uh, or I can send it to you as well. And there's much more detail about the surveys in those cases. 네, 다음은 영국의 제임스 멜로 판사님. George Nunnell from the okay, UK. Okay, um, we in the UK also have a very long history of surveys in trademark cases. Um, and it's fair to say our law has developed in a different way <laughs> to uh, it has in America and, and indeed many other countries. Um, and you may think that the law on surveys so far as the UK is concerned, is out of step with many other jurisdictions. Now, to explain UK law, it will help if you, if you look at the relevant case law in the booklet. So it's page 495 to 6 in the English version or page 202 in Korean. Because what I need to explain to you is some of the history. So we started off in the 1970s uh, essentially, people, plaintiffs were trying to prove a likelihood of confusion or deception using a statistically significant result from a survey. Uh, and judges have always been somewhat suspicious of results from survey evidence in the UK. And those suspicions led to the first group of um, requirements that I've set out on page 202. They're from the Imperial and Philip Morris group in 1984. And you can see from these seven requirements, you can see what was concerning the judges at the time. So the first two, all surveys conducted, their methodology and results must be disclosed and the totality of all answers must be disclosed. That arose from a suspicion that basically the court wasn't being given the, the full picture. So you could go out and do a survey, and uh, as a claimant, you don't like the results. So you do it again, but slightly differently. And then you only present the latter survey to the court. So the courts were suspicious of that. Three and four, questions must not be leading. And the questions must not lead the interviewee into a field of speculation upon which they would not otherwise have embarked. Now, a lot of the questions that have been cited in the reference book from other jurisdictions wouldn't be allowed in the UK because they're too leading. And that creates, it creates a difficulty for the, for the claimant 
because if you don't have some sort of leading element in the question, you don't get the answer you want. So for example, in a case about the Levi's arcuate stitching mark, they showed respondents a picture of somebody wearing jeans, the Levi 501s, for example, and the picture extended from the waist down to the knees. And they asked a very general non-leading question, what can you tell me about this photograph? And they got loads of answers like, the, the jeans are a bit baggy. <laughs> And that's the, that illustrates the problem. If you don't ask a leading question, you don't get the answer that you want. Whereas if you ask a leading question, often it carries no weight with an English judge. So those were the guidelines down in, laid down in 1984. And that led claimants away from trying to establish a statistically significant survey. And we moved on to a second stage where we used surveys to try and identify good witnesses to bring to court. So we, we were using surveys not for a statistically significant result, but as a witness collection ex exercise. And so then you'd, you'd pick your five or 10 best witnesses, bring them to court, and you'd present them as you were trying to persuade that the judge that these people were normal members of the public, you know, ordinarily careful, um, that, and their reaction should be paid attention to. And for quite some time, those witness collection exercises did work. Now, then we move to the third stage, because a particular judge in the Court of Appeal, Lord Justice Lewison, uh, he wasn't an IP uh, judge, but he had done a few IP cases as a judge at first instance. And he thought these surveys cost too much money and were often kicked out as being of no use. So he then, he thought he'd do something about it in the Interflora litigation. And he established this cost benefit test, uh, which has resulted in a whole new area of case management of surveys in the UK. And so essentially, the, there is an initial stage where you have to go to a judge and say, look, these are the questions we want to ask. And the judge won't give advice on them, but he'll say, well, you know, okay, how much is it going to cost? Do I think it's worth asking these questions? Um, and even, even if you are given permission to adduce a survey and evidence, once you've done the survey, you still have to demonstrate the results are, well, they pass, the, again, the cost-benefit analysis. Now, what that has done is it has led to a, very, a, a significant reduction in the amount of survey evidence that, uh, that can be brought in UK cases. Um, now, one thing to point out, not everybody agrees with what Lord Justice Lewison did in Interflora. Um, in fact, as a judge now, I know that some of these trademark cases, when you don't have any survey evidence, are very much more difficult to decide because you never get to hear what an ordinary member of the public actually thinks. But be that as it may, we're stuck, <laughs> we're stuck with the Interflora guidelines. Now, the other thing to note about the Interflora guidelines, they were primarily directed at questions which were seeking to establish a likelihood of confusion. Lord Justice Lewison was very suspicious of these types of questions. He left an exception if you were doing a survey to try and establish distinctiveness. Now you may think those two notions of trademark law are very closely connected uh, and that there shouldn't be a real distinction between the two, but there is a distinction, <laughs> at least in our law. Yes. It's my turn. Uh, in Japan, the survey result is used to support the distinctiveness of a trademark and 
public recognition. Uh, but generally speaking, in civil litigation in Japan, there are no requirements for the evidence to be examined by the court. So a survey result may be submitted as evidence in a trademark litigation. However, it is said that the result of the survey is not deemed quite concrete and reliable by the court in many cases because as the court itself does not execute, execute the survey. And the survey is usually executed by one side party. Thus, it seems that the said party tries to lead a favorable outcome from the survey by means of using deliberate questions and deliberately selected samples. So basically, the court in Japan does not attach importance to the survey. In addition to that, as far as I know, there is, there is no precedence in which the court presented the preferable way to conduct the survey speci uh, specifically and precisely. So my presentation uh, of this section is based on the opinion of scholars and attorneys. So according to the paper written by the professor Inoue, uh, the, in these days, the survey so, uh, through the, in the internet is most popular. According to, to that survey, about 61.7% uh, of consumer survey uh, is down through the internet, and 8.3% is down by face-to-face -face questionnaire. It is said that in order to make the survey reliable, the survey is preferably conducted before the trial decision. And a non-inductive question is preferable. And at least leading questions. What? Sorry. And uh, at least leading questions should be avoided. Questions uh, relate to legal issues such as similarity of marks and the likelihood of confusion should be avoided. Uh, it is because the, uh, such kind of questions is determined by the court and not determined by the recognition of the uh, consumers. And population should be consist of consumers of the product for which the mark uses. And samples must be chosen throughout Japan. I will uh, show you some cases in which the survey result was submitted as an evidence and the court mentioned the result in the uh, reasoning. The first case is Yakuto, Yakuto case. Uh, 95, uh, 98 uh, or more percent of consumers responded that they would be uh, reminded of Yakuto when they saw the container in question. So the court ruled that this 3D mark has distinctiveness and should be registered as a trademark. And second one is Louis Vuitton Epic case. In this case, about 75% of women recognized that Epi mark or Epi line as a mark used for the product of Louis Vuitton. So the court held that the mark acquired distinctiveness through use. And third one is a very famous Levi's case, and uh, it, uh, the uh, Professor Tangura also uh, explained that case in the previous session. And, uh, and the uh, bow type stitch has been recognized as a mark of Levi's by 16.6% uh, .6 of consumers, and the court determined that bow type stitch is well known, but not famous. And uh, Professor Tamura said that uh, and the threshold is uh, about 10%, uh, but I, in my opinion, it's very uh, too small. And, and uh, the 16% is uh, also too small to be determined uh, very known, but uh, it's only my personal opinion. And uh, at last, I will introduce one example of the question used in the practical case called Rose O'Neill QP case. Uh, 
uh, in Japan, there is a famous company named QP, which sells food, especially mayonnaise, requested a trial on the invalidation for the trademark of Rose O'Neill QP. And they wanted to prove the Rose O'Neill QP reminds consumers of the name of QP. So they conducted the survey with these questions. They asked with, uh, any answer is okay. Please feel free to let us know your answer. Uh, to avoid leading them on. So it seems to be no, uh, neutral questions. Uh, however, uh, unfort unfortunately, they failed to prove it and uh, lost the case. So, ah, it is the last. Uh, just I wanted, to, <laughs> I wanted you to see our uh, brand new <laughs> business code. Uh, it's called business code, and uh, we had launched uh, it in October. So. It's, uh, that's all. <laughs> <Okay. laughs> <laughs> Judge Huisu, the floor is yours. Judge Risu, I believe you're on mute. Sorry. Can you hear me? Yes. Hello? Yes, we can hear you well. Okay, thank you. And in China, the types of evidence include material evidence, documentary evidence, audiovisual material, testimony of witnesses, statements of the parties, expert conclusions, records of inspection, etc. The court will examine the legality, authenticity, and the relevance of various evidences in accordance with legal procedures. The questionnaire will also be adopted by Chinese courts when they try cases. Chiaodan case is a typical example. Chiaodan Sport Limited Company, a Chinese sports wear and shoes manufacturer, hereafter after referred to as Chiaodan Sports, Register the Chema Chaodan. This this is its Chema. For clothing, shoes, hats, etc. US baseball ranger Michael Jeffrey Jordan filed a request to cancel the Chema. Knipper and two courts did not support Michael Jordan's claim for the reason is that Chaodan is an American common surname. The evidence is inefficient to prove that Chaodan in the disability mark definitely points to Michael Jordan. And here is the whole case. Michael Jordan filed an application for retrial on December 8, 2016. The Supreme People's Court delivered a verdict that the Chema Chaodan in Chinese characters has infringed upon the prior rights of personal name of Michael Jordan and order Knipa to remake the decision. In this case, Michael Jordan's attorney collected strong evidence showing a stable link between the Chinese character Chao Dan and the name of Michael Jordan, as well the high personnel reputation of Michael Jordan amongst Chinese consumers. The most critical pieces of evidence are two notarized investigation reports, Michael Jordan and Chaodan Sports Association survey reports, nationwide in Shanghai. The two reports, this is its criteria, and this is the uh, question and conclusion. I will now repeat, uh, the Supreme Court found that the process of investigation and evidence collection is much standardized and authenticity and the proof of the investigation conclusion was relatively high, which together with other evidence could prove the relevant facts of the case. In the above mentioned cases, the trial court did not adjust the survey plan with the litigants in advance. Questionnaire survey was a kind of evidence submitted to the court by litigant. Generally speaking, the probative value of such evidence is relatively high. In China's judicial practice, litigants usually apply for notarizing the questionnaire survey before submitting it to the court. 
or apply to the notary agency to participate in investigation, act as evidence preservation, and issue a notarial certificate. When deciding whether to adopt the conclusion of the questionnaire survey, the court will generally consider the following facts, whether the purpose of the survey is reasonable and clear, whether the survey group designation is accurate, whether the questionnaire design is scientific, reasonable, and not misleading, whether the execution method and data statistical analysis are correct and objective. In a world, judicial adjudication is a comprehensive work the court should combine the questionnaire survey, other identification factors, and specific facts in accordance with the provisions of the law to make a fair verdict. That's all. Thank you. 네, 감사합니다. 다음은 권봉 판사님. So thank you very much. Next, Judge Wong. A prominent Indian statistician, uh, Rao, wrote in his book that all judgments are in their rationale statistics. I sometimes think that our law, including statutes and precedents, is the accumulated sum of solutions throughout history that were more likely to solve the given problems better. Furthermore, people today, including judges, seem to believe in numerical data more than worthy logic. Uh, so. Uh, I'm a pro-statistics judge. <laughs> the, the spirit of this epoch forms the setting of the emergence of survey evidence in trademark case. The only statute that explicitly mentions survey evidence is the enforcement regulation of the trademark uh, article 28, which states uh, that consumer awareness surveys may be submitted as evidence to prove the acquisition of distinctiveness through use. According to a study in 2020, survey evidence is submitted to prove or dis disprove consumer awareness, distinctiveness, similarity, or likelihood of confusion. And among them, consumer awareness surveys to investigate whether a mark is well known to consumers are most frequently conducted. With its high-speed internet connectivity, more and more surveys are conducted online in Korea. However, the survey method per se does not affect its pro probative power. Occasionally, both parties submit survey evidence and contest each other's survey, which is sometimes time and cost consuming. To avoid that kind of that kind of situation, the patent court once took on a leading role in commissioning a survey. These days, uh, the court sometimes involves in preparing the questionnaire before the parties commission their own survey. To guarantee the objectivity and reliability of survey evidence, the survey should conform to state-of-the-art survey methodology. I guess it's, this is not very differ, different among countries, so I'll advance to the conclusion. The court and the Korean IP office are trying to refine their standards and rules to embrace survey evidence as a new practice. <laughs> I hope this conference will provide the opportunity to understand better and further invite discussions on this issue. Thank you for your attention. 네, 다음은 독일의 실무에 관해서 크리스티안 슈마츠 판사님의 동영상을 5분간 시청하겠습니다. Ladies and gentlemen, I will now cover a very few aspects regarding the third and final section trademark survey evidence. This part, however, will be a lot shorter because I was not able to find a lot of data regarding this topic. First of all, there are no special rules of evidence for trademark litigation in Germany. As regards consumer surveys, they are in particular used to address the question of whether a mark has acquired distinctiveness through use. These surveys are usually not used with regard to the perception of the relevant public, 
the similarity of signs, and finally, the likelihood of confusion. Rather, the specialized court establishing the facts may, especially if its members are part of the relevant public, consider these questions on its own. If the members of the court themselves belong to the relevant public, it is generally not necessary to take recourse to an expert opinion, supported by an opinion poll, in order to determine the understanding of the public. Even if the members of the court establishing the facts do not belong to the relevant public, they may assess the view of the relevant circles of experts on the basis of their own expertise, if no special knowledge or experience is required. Courts which are constantly involved in competition and trademark cases may, moreover, have acquired the necessary expertise to be able to independently assess how circles of experts or the public, which they do not belong to, perceive a certain sign. However, a taking of evidence is required if the court lacks the necessary expertise or if, despite of its own expertise, it must have doubts about the result. There are no general restrictions imposed on the types and methods of admissible, of admissible surveys. However, the survey must be methodologically sound. There are no methods which are obligatory and several different ways of conducting surveys can be distinguished, each with their advantages and disadvantages. Common interview modes are face-to-face -face interviews, by telephone and online interfaces, mostly in the form of so-called online access panels. The appropriate method of conducting a survey should be chosen by a survey expert on a case-by-case -case basis. There are no specific types of surveys used for different issues. As to the question on how to overcome the time difference between the relevant date of examination and the time of survey, I would like to point out the following. For the assessment of the protectability of a trademark, the time of filing is decisive. Therefore, the acquired distinctiveness must also be present at the time of filing and still exist at the time of the decision on the application. In this regard, the Federal Court of Justice has held that longer periods of time between the filing date and the date on which a survey is conducted preclude the assumption that the result of the survey can be related back to the filing date. However, this depends on the particular circumstances on the, of the case. The court further stated, at least in product areas in which the period of time between the filing of the applica application and the preparation of the survey may lead to a change in the market and the products and thus to a change in the use, change in the use of the sign in question, a retroactive relationship over a longer period of time is out of the question. Something else can only apply in special cases subject to strict conditions. This is to be assumed if the products in question do not change rapidly in special product areas and the market development can be reliably assessed over a longer period of time. Finally, I would like to introduce the guidelines issued by the German Patent and Trademark Office, which also contain evident advice on consumer surveys. Regarding the survey questions, these guidelines recommend the following approach. The first step in questioning is to determine whether the interviewee is a member of the relevant public. Then it is to be asked whether the respondent has already perceived the sign in question in connection with the goods or services claimed, so-called degree of awareness. Only then can the group of persons who know the sign or to whom it appears spontaneously familiar be asked whether they see it as an indication of a specific company or several companies, so-called degree of identification. The public who assessed the mark applied for as an indication of business origin for one or more companies must then be asked whether they can name them, so-called degree of attribution. The correct names do not have to be mentioned here, but the public that expressly assigns the trademark to another company is deducted. Care must be taken to ensure that the question about the degree of recognition in particular does not already suggest the origin indicating character of the sign. Once again, thank you very much for your attention. 네, 감사합니다. 김영기 판사님 질의 부탁드립니다.
So thank you very much, uh, Judge Kim. Uh, you can ask your question. We are now. over 6 p.m. already. Somebody might feel starving. We are almost uh, done. Uh, this time, I want to call Professor Bernstein again. Uh, professor, we know you are well you are well known for leading the Booking.com case in the United States Supreme Court and win the big battle, right? Could you please briefly share your special experience through the case, especially what knowledge about using survey evidence in the U.S. court can we get from that case? So we, we were engaged actually to represent Booking.com uh, only in the Supreme Court. Another law firm handled the case below. Um, but what was interesting was that the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office in, in challenging the registration of Booking.com never challenged the survey because they felt that the, the name legally was generic, that if you took a generic term and the, the, the case accepts that booking is a generic term for a website on which you can make bookings and just append a, a top-level domain to it, Booking.com, the position of the trademark office was as a matter of law, that could never be a trademark. Um, and so because the Patent and Trademark Office never challenged the survey, the Supreme Court didn't have the opportunity to really dig into whether the survey was properly done or not. It was just accepted that the survey was appropriate. We now have uh, uh, two other cases against the Trademark Office, and because they recognize that they lost that approach, they're uh, being much more rigorous in attacking surveys and really looking at whether the surveys are appropriate. So I think we'll see a lot more litigation in the United States about the particular ways in which the survey is done. Um, one other just interesting tidbit about the Booking.com case is that it was the very first case argued in the United States Supreme Court after the pandemic began. Uh, we actually had our argument date and uh, the Supreme Court went on lockdown and closed the court, and our, our case was, our argument was canceled. But uh, a few weeks later, the Supreme Court decided to hear cases by telephone. And so our case was the first case ever argued in the United States uh, by telephone. And then the, the last little tidbit is you probably have read that our Supreme Court can be very split on many issues. Uh, a lot of important cases are decided on a five to four basis. But we were quite pleased that uh, we won this case eight to one, which I do think sends the message that there was a very broad consensus uh, in the court for recognizing that trademarks like Booking.com, if they are perceived by consumers as being a brand name, uh, should be protected. Thank you. Thank you again. Uh, the last question goes to your honor, James Meller. You, you are the hero of this section. Okay, you mentioned, uh, yes, this question is about requirements of trademark survey, reference book page number 191. Uh, you mentioned in the questionnaire answer, through experience, courts have learned to distrust surveys conducted for the purpose of litigation. In particular, surveys to establish a likelihood of confusion or deception was subject to strict requirements laid down in the case law. Into, into Florida case like. They are required to pass a cost benefit assessment and generally such surveys are discouraged, you mentioned like that. Could you elaborate on this part? Why are stricter requirements imposed on the survey to establish a likelihood confusion or deception? And with respect to cost, sorry. With respect to cost benefit assessment, what if Party intends to improve. Party intends to prove the likelihood of confusion or deception through a survey evidence, irrespective of cost. In that case, would cost not permit such proof through a survey unless the strict requirements are met? Yeah. Okay. We need to go back into the Interflora case a little bit because um, in Interflora number one, what Lord Justice Lewis did. He reviewed every trademark case in which surveys were mentioned over the last, I don't know, 40 years. And what he noted from his review is that very often surveys were not relied on by a judge. So he decided 
these were very costly pieces of evidence and they required a justification. That's why he established the cost-benefit test. Now, you, to understand these trademark cases, you need to understand that the likelihood of confusion is a question for the judge. We, in the UK, we call it a jury-type question, which means it's just, it's, it's like a, some, you've got to make your mind up on it, but there, there aren't any guidelines to, to guide you. And what judges often did in these trademark cases is they'd, they would say, well, I think, leaving the survey aside, I think this mark would be confused with the other one, and my conclusion is confirmed by the survey evidence. Um, that's in the few cases where survey evidence was relied upon. Um, so Lord Justice Lewison concluded that actually surveys were generally, generally they didn't work, but they were also very expensive. But going back to the question, um, a trademark trial in the UK generally costs a lot of money. And if, if say, 10% of those costs relate to the survey and the parties are willing to spend that money, one might say, well, why shouldn't they? <laughs> and so, you know, there are many questions about the Interflora case because although Lord Justice Lewiston was clearly trying to reduce the cost of the litigation, I don't think he actually succeeded at all. Um, because quite often these survey, I mean surveys, they do cost a lot to, to undertake and they cost even more for the lawyers to pour all over them and then to present them in court. But nonetheless, it, they are, the cost of a survey generally are quite a small percentage of the total cost of a trademark case. So it's another respect in which I think Lord Justice Lewison didn't really understand what was going on. <laughs> in survey cases and trademark cases. But nonetheless, we're stuck with the cost-benefit test. OK, thank you, Your Honor. Actually, I prepared more questions for Judge Su from China, but I cannot but skip the question. But finally, I want to take this opportunity to express my great appreciation for all the speakers' sincere answers to our long and in-depth questionnaire. It was really long, right? But not wrong. <웃음> Thank you. 자, 이상으로 모든 토픽에 관한 With 논의를 마쳤습니다. 다만 예정 시간을 크게 초과하진 않았기 때문에 현장에 계신 참가자분 한두 가지 PD가 있으시면 바뀌겠습니다. 바뀌겠습니다. Kim.com, the court accept the 75% of survey as a, a token of uh, distinctiveness. My question is a kind of asking your personal question. If the, some survey show what percent, above what percentage, they can be a sign of distinctiveness. That's a very good question. Um, so generally, uh, because we're asking, do you, we're asking consumers, do you perceive this as a brand name or do you perceive it as a common name? Um, we look to the majority. And so to show that a trademark uh, is not generic, the, court, the number that courts generally are looking for is above 50%. Um, and so here with booking.com being at 75%, it was very high above the 50% threshold. If it gets very close to the threshold, then the courts may start to look at in more detail at the survey. For example, were the other terms that you used in the survey fair? One of the questions that came up here is how do we treat the 33% who said they thought washingmachine.com um, was a brand name? There was, there was one expert who proposed that that should be subtracted from the 75%. And if you subtracted that, it would bring it below 50 Ultimately, as I mentioned in response to Judge Kim's question before, the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office didn't really challenge the methodology of the survey. 
they made uh, the case more about the legal argument. But that is a question that we might have to face in cases in the future. Should we deduct, uh, as, as uh, Justice Schmaltz measured, uh, mentioned in the German uh, situation, should we deduct the sort of wrong answers about washingmachine.com? Um, when it comes to secondary meaning, so when it comes, to, this is whether or not the trademark is generic. When it comes to secondary meaning, courts typically look for 30 to 5% or more to establish secondary meaning. And when it comes to likelihood of confusion, courts typically say it's about 15% or higher, as I mentioned in one of my earlier slides. There's very good reasons to think that's wrong, that the number should be lower because of the way it was developed historically at a time before we had controls. But nevertheless, that is what the expected threshold is in the United States today. Due to the time, we won't be able to entertain any more questions. Please kindly understand. Uh, you can refer to the reference book with regards to details about the uh, topics that were discussed. And I extend my deep gratitude to all of our panelists once again. And also, my thanks goes out to all the participants online and in person. This closes our session three. Thank you. Thank you. That was a very fulfilling session. Uh, please join me in giving a big round of applause to the moderator and speakers of this session. Panelists께서는 그 무대에서 사진을 찍고 퇴장하시면 되겠습니다. Panelists will take a photo on the stage. Thank you all for a great session, and I also thank the audience for your attention. 오늘 참석해 주신 모든 분들께 대단히 감사드리며 청중석에 계신 분들께도 경청해 주셔서 깊이 감사드립니다. We will arrive at the end of our first day of the conference. I hope you enjoy present evening and look forward to seeing you tomorrow. Thank you. 이것으로 2022 특허보험 컨퍼런스 1일차 행사를 모두 마치겠습니다. 편안한 저녁 보내시고 내일 뵙겠습니다. As the seats are pre-arranged during a banquet, please check your seat and be seated. Please stay on here for banquet. The banquet will begin at 6:40. Uh, 만찬 때는 좌석 배치가 변경됩니다. 참석 인원께서는 좌석을 확인해 주시기 바랍니다. 어, 만찬은 어, 18시 40분에 뵙겠, 어, 참, 시작합니다. 그리고 대전역으로.